Today's song contains one of the most iconic opening riffs of all time, maybe the greatest ever, for one of the most notorious and dangerous bands of the 80s. Beloved by rockers of all generations, it actually really pissed off the guitarist who wrote it. That's because it wasn't supposed to be a song. Instead, this guitarist had written it as a training exercise, and to his ears, it sounded like a, a circus melody, is what he said. Meanwhile, his bandmate, a fiery train wreck of a front man, well, he absolutely loved it. He actually penned a poem sometime before that, and it fit perfectly, and he was adamant about recording this song. It was a really good call, because this song stormed the charts, and it was the rocket fuel that helped their album become the biggest selling debut in history. But before that, it almost didn't get even off the ground, because MTV refused to play it, if you can imagine that. One phone call could change everything. Stories coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If you remember when music was so diverse that on mainstream radio, you could go from hearing rock to new wave to glam metal. Right here, with fewer commercials and less repetition. You're going to dig this channel. Those were the good old days. Make sure that you subscribe below right now and click the bell so that you never miss an interview or a video. We also have a Patreon. You're going to want to check that out. We're starting to put full interviews there, exclusive content. You can even become an honorary producer to help us curate this music history. It's all about keeping the music alive. So it's time for another edition of our series, The New Standards. This is a show where we take an in-depth look into songs that truly transcend genre, decade, and really fads. Songs that are monumental touchstones in our culture and in our society. Previous episodes, we've covered Black by Pearl Jam. Pictures of You by The Cure recently. But today, we're going to give you the story behind the 1988 number one hit, Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses. <laughs> In its early iteration, Guns N' Roses was comprised of rhythm guitarist Izzy Stradlin, bassist Duff McKagan, drummer Steven Adler, a lead guitarist who only needed one name, Slash, and at the center of the storm, legendary and chaotic frontman Axl Rose. Now, Axl grew up in Indiana, but he fled the Hoosier State in the early 80s to escape an abusive upbringing. When he grew up, he'd been badly beaten by his stepfather, and as a sad consequence, he developed quite a, a volatile temper. Axl Rose went cross-country to L.A. where he became active in the local hard rock scene. Uh, there he threw in with multiple bands, with Izzy Stradlin, Tracy Guns, and Rob Gardner. Uh, this is where he formed a rock band that was called, in turn, Rose. Hollywood Rose. And then uh, L.A. Guns. After Guns and Gardner left, they were replaced by Steven Adler and Slash. With the addition of bass player Duff McKagan, the group renamed themselves Guns and Roses. Uh, historic. Following their U.S. Hell Tour, 85, GNR released the EP Live Like a Suicide. Uh, that was on the independent label Uzi Suicide. This sparked some serious interest from critics and record companies alike, including Geffen, uh, who ultimately signed the band in 1986. Now, by this point, Guns N' Roses had become the most notorious upstarts on the L.A. rock scene and a fixture on the city's infamously sleazy Sunset Strip. Their shows were the stuff of legend, or maybe nightmares, depending on your persuasion. And their lives revolved around partying, alcohol, and scoring drugs with groupies. That last category was a habit Axel would attempt to break after he met his soon-to-be girlfriend, Erin Everly. Uh, she would have a profound effect on the song Sweet Child of Mine. More on that in a second. The two met at a club in New York where Erin was working as a model. Reportedly, Axel was instantly taken with her, and he swore off groupies as a result of that. Aaron Invicta Everly was the oldest daughter of legendary 60s pop icon Don Everly, of course, of the Everly brothers, and Hollywood actress Venetia Stevenson. Now, she and Axel started seeing each other in the summer of 86, and soon after, she moved to L.A. to be close to him. Aaron was unlike any girl that Axel had spent any time with before. She was positive, she was intelligent, She's really kind and well brought up. And while Aaron came from a show business lineage, Axel was a self-described hick from nowhere. 
The two were, for all intents and purposes, complete opposites. She was the uptown girl to his downtown guy, put it mildly. No one thought it would last at all, said Steve Adler. Aaron was just the sweetest girl, and I thought for sure that she wouldn't be able to stand Axel for very long. They were always arguing about this or that, and at times it would get really intense. When he first brought her around, she was so cool, and I honestly thought, I hope Axel doesn't screw this one up. Around the same time Axel and Aaron started seeing each other, a GNR got to work on their debut album, The Great Appetite for Destruction. Uh, they entered LA's Rumbo Studios in August of 86, and they teamed up with producer Mike Klink. Klink was a studio veteran, and he was undaunted by the band's controversial reputation. Really, it didn't phase him at all. While proving to be a firm hand, he was also you know, flexible enough to let the guys be who they really were. Klink was determined to capture the band's essence, you know, not to beat it into the ground. Subsequently, most of the tracks ended up being recorded in just a couple of takes. Now, as we further break down Guns N' Roses, Sweet Child of Mine, I want to thank today's sponsor, IOLO. We are all so reliant on our computers. I mean, we're storing more content and personal information than ever before. Protection against real-time malware and viruses should always be a top priority, but for a long time, there wasn't one software product that would do it all. Fortunately, that's changed with IOLO System Mechanic Ultimate Defense a product that is so much more than your average PC tune-up software. Named Editor's Choice by PC Magazine eight years in a row, IOLO System Mechanic Ultimate Defense does everything you need, from boosting your speed to securing your digital life with an all-in-one optimization, antivirus, and online privacy software suite. In addition to defense against personal data collection, System Mechanic Ultimate Defense also has a handy password manager that keeps your online account credentials encrypted and secure. Get your PC protected and optimized immediately by clicking on the dedicated link below and type in the promo code Professor of Rock, all caps, to save 60% on System Mechanic Ultimate Defense and, as an added bonus, get 30 days of live tech support absolutely free. So by December of 1986, all the tracks were recorded and Mike Klink was certain that Guns N' Roses was going to be massive. He even told Geffen and A&R man Tom Zutat that Appetite for Destruction was going to sell 2 million copies. Tom, however, uh, disagreed. He said, no, it's going to be 5 million copies. Now, both would miss the mark by a long shot. Appetite for Destruction would go on to sell 18 million records in the U.S. alone, and it's still selling. It made it the, the highest-selling debut album of all time. It leapfrogged over uh, Boston's debut album. Appetite for Destruction included the singles It's So Easy. It's so Mr. Brownstone, that was in the UK. We've been dancing with Mr. Brownstone. Welcome to the jungle. To the jungle. We got fun and games. We got Paradise City. And Night Train. And of course, today's featured song, Sweet Child of Mine. So the famous guitar riff that opens Sweet Child of Mine, that actually evolved from a string skipping exercise. Uh, Slash called it a circus melody. He said that he just liked to come up with hard to play riffs to help him improve you know, his fingering techniques. He thought it sounded like a circus melody. That's pretty funny. However, when Izzy heard what Slash was up to, he was absolutely blown away. And, you know, he tried to coax the lead guitarist to keep playing it. I don't know, said Slash in reply. It's messing around. But Izzy kept on him, and he came up with some chords to help flesh it out. From there, Duff worked in a bass line, and Steve added a beat to fuse it all together. Within just an hour, Slash's guitar exercise had taken on a life of its own, but its very own. That night, Axl Rose stayed up in his room, and he didn't join the rest of the band as they hashed it out, uh, tried to figure it out musically. According to Adler, Axl Rose just kept to himself, not because he was stuck up or even shy, it's just because he liked to do his own thing. Regardless, though, Axl heard everything the guys were playing, and he was inspired by it. So he started writing lyrics based on a poem that he'd already written 
about his girlfriend, Aaron. Said Rose, Sweet Child of Mine is a true love song about my girlfriend at this time. I'd written this poem. I'd reached a dead end with it, and I kind of put it on the shelf. Then Slash and Izzy got working together on songs, and I came in. Izzy hit a rhythm, and all of a sudden, this poem popped into my head. It all just came together. It's the first positive love song that I've ever written. I never had anyone to write anything that positive about, really. For all that fiery altercation that the couple's relationship would be plagued by, a reading of Sweet Child's lyrics they leave no room for doubt that Axel genuinely cared for Erin Everly. She got a smile that it seems to me reminds me of childhood memories where everything was as fresh as the bright blue sky. Truly poetry. Slash, however, wasn't sold on the song, and he started to regret even playing the riff at all. He called it a very sappy ballad. Obviously, for such a hardcore band known for going you know, balls to the wall, this was a little bit soft. From that perspective, it's easy to understand why Slash wasn't exactly you know, thrilled. It was a joke, is what he said. We were hanging out one night and I started playing that riff. The next thing you know, Izzy made up some chords behind it and Axel went off on it. I used to hate playing that sucker. Rose, however, was adamant about the song's potential and he pushed the band to record it, absolutely. The majestic solo by Slash has been called one of the greatest ever put down on record. It was also influenced by several other classic songs. Slash told Rolling Stone, it's a combination of influences really, from Jeff Beck, Cream, and Zeppelin to stuff that you'd be really surprised at. The solos in Man For Man's version of Blinded By The Light. and Jerry Rafferty's Baker Street. Over the years, he's talked a, a lot about Jerry Rafferty's Baker Street solo. You can definitely hear the influence. Take a listen. An edited radio-friendly version of Sweet Child of Mine was released as a single in June of 1988, that beautiful summer of 88 when Appetite started to take over. This song immediately broke into the U.S. Top 40. It was roughly a, a year after the release of Appetite for Destruction. Song and album would both rise to the top of the Billboard charts almost in tandem. With Appetite reaching number one on August the 6th, 1988, and Sweet Child just a month later on September 10th. Sweet Child of Mine was definitely the song of that summer, along with Pour Some Sugar On Me. It also peaked at number one on the Cashbox chart, and it went to number seven on the mainstream rock chart, which is cool for a ballad. Internationally, it reached number 20 in the Netherlands, number 15 in Switzerland, a number 11 in Austria and Australia, number seven in Canada, number six in the UK, went to number five in New Zealand, and number four in Ireland. Now, thanks to the momentum of Sweet Child of Mine, Appetite for Destruction would sell 3 million copies worldwide by the end of 1988. And in the process, it would transform GNR, Guns N' Roses, from really an underground band of rockers into a worldwide phenomenon. Really quick. I also got to mention the music video for Sweet Child of Mine. The video shows Guns N' Roses rehearsing at Mendiola's ballroom at Huntington Park, uh, shot over a period of uh, two days. The video features not only the band, but every band member's girlfriend at the time, including the girl who inspired the lyrics, Aaron Everly. Actually, it would be the first of three videos that had Axel showing off uh, one of his girlfriends, although it was the only one that Aaron would appear in. Later, of course, Stephanie Seymour, the uh, Victoria's Secret model. She became the main Guns Girls for Don't Cry and, of course, November Rain. And, it's hard to hold a candle. and after that, Axel appears to have sworn off girlfriends in music videos in favor of dolphins. Yeah, that's, that's a whole different story. All kind of dolphin references in the second half of the video.
as for Sweet Child of Mine, since the song's release, it has appeared in a number of movies and TV shows, including Big Daddy. CSI New York, Gulliver's Travels, The Wrestler. Randy. Randy. Family Guy, The Big Short, Step Brothers, The Office. Sweet Girl, Tokyo Vice, Let the Right One In. And then recently, Thor, Love and Thunder. And if you've been watching credit card commercials lately, you can actually catch uh, Slash performing Sweet Child of Mine for a mock band audition. Stop. You're in. Oh, cool. Pretty funny. Sweet Child of Mine is by far the most covered Guns N' Roses song. I mean, the list is virtually endless. But just for a sample, here's some of the artists who've taken a stab at it. Sheryl Crow. <laughs> Lincoln Park, John Mayer, Tiffany. Dinosaur Jr., Night Ranger, Black Eyed Peas, Tenacious D. Candlebox, Bonnie Tyler, 311, Sebastian Bach, Kelly Clarkson, The Darkness, and Melissa Etheridge. Oh, sweet child of mine. Fastball, David Guetta. Jason Mraz, Soundgarden, Switchfoot, and Carrie Underwood teamed up with Axl Rose just recently to do it. So you remember when I mentioned that both Appetite for Destruction and Sweet Child of Mine rose to number one around the same time? Well, that almost never happened, actually. Shockingly, nine months after its release, Guns N' Roses' debut album was dead in the water. A lot of people don't remember this. It was branded a failure by Geffen Records. In that time, it had only sold a modest 200,000 copies. In the beginning, the band's reputation had really been working against them. And cable networks threatened to drop MTV if they played videos by GNR. The band had pretty much been blacklisted. But Guns N' Roses caught a break when David Geffen, who had a lot of power, he called in a favorite of the music video channel. Axel and company were given one slot at 5 a.m. Eastern time on a Sunday. The video that got the nod was actually Welcome to the Jungle. And against all odds, the video took MTV by storm. MTV switchboards lit up with people freaking out over this video and this song. And they were freaking out in a good way. So MTV added the video to their rotation and GNR started building some real momentum. But if it was Welcome to the Jungle that cracked the door open, it was definitely Sweet Child of Mine that kicked it open once and for all. Thanks to Sweet Child's heavy rotation on MTV, Guns N' Roses became the most popular band in America by far at that time. In fact, Geffen's a &R guy, Tom Zutat, that I told you about, he called it long before it happened. He believed that Sweet Child of Mine was the song that would really push the band over the top. So he made sure it got buried deep on the backside of Appetite for Destruction, track nine out of 12. That way it wouldn't get wasted as a first or second single. Said Tom about it, I did that because I knew that promotion people and the radio people at that time very rarely listened past the first two or three songs. I did not want that song to be discovered until later. Yeah, the band needed to stir up some buzz before they released this one for sure. Sweet Child of Mine, it was a song that was meant for the masses. But it needed some lead-in time for that. That strategy paid off dividends. Sweet Child of Mine dominated mainstream radio as well as MTV, and it rocketed Guns N' Roses into the stratosphere as the story goes. Even past their rock idols Aerosmith, whom they were opening for at the time, they became more popular than them. As the song started building momentum, venues started filling up and going wild even before Axel and crew took the stage. Where do we go? Oh, where do we go now? He also stole the cover of Rolling Stone from Aerosmith on that same tour. It was something that the bad boys from Boston were pretty pissed off about. But Sweet Child of Mine, it wasn't just a song for that moment in history. It was destined to become one of the biggest rockers ever. Maybe not in terms of weeks spent at number one, 
but rather just how big its pop culture footprint has been. And it's been enormous. If there's any indication, three decades after its release, Sweet Child of Mine became the first music video from the 80s of any genre to break a billion views on YouTube. That actually happened on October 15, 2019. At this point, factoring in uh, the different variations of this song on YouTube, not counting covers even, or anything like that, the view count is actually two billion. Two billion for one song. So coming full circle here, I wanna come back to Axel and the girl who inspired this mega hit, Aaron Everly. What happened to him? Well, unfortunately, it would not be a fairy tale ending, as many of you know. Axel and Aaron continued to date up until about April of 1990, when they actually tied the knot at Las Vegas in a wedding chapel. But the honeymoon was short-lived, because just like their dating relationship had been, their marriage was a powder keg ready to blow, or at least Axel's temper was. Rose would later admit how hard it was for him to control his jealousy. Some of his unchecked emotional issues undoubtedly played a role in undermining uh, their marriage. Sadly, their union would be annulled in January of 1991. Pretty short there. Just as GNR was starting to record uh, Use Your Illusion 1 and 2, actually. When talking about their relationship, though, Axl Rose stated, Aaron and I treated each other like crap. Sometimes we treated each other great because the children in us were best friends. But then there were other times when we just messed up each other's lives completely, end of quote. Sad as it was for Axel and Aaron to come to an end, at least a great song came out of it, a timeless song. And there is one more silver lining as well. Slash, who despised Sweet Child of Mine, finally came around to liking it. I hated it for years, he said, but it would cause such a reaction just playing the first stupid notes. It used to evoke this hysteria. So I finally gotten to appreciate that. There's no question that Appetite for Destruction was my generation's big album, Gen X. Every kid had it. It was a rite of passage. I remember buying it and you know, hiding it from my parents like all my other friends. It was probably the most confiscated album in the history of my childhood or yours, whether it was teachers taking it away or parents. But Sweet Child of Mine was the song that pulled everyone in and kind of changed that. I remember my dad was driving us, a car full of my friends, to an activity, and you know it came on the radio. My dad turned it up, and every single one of us sang it to the, to the top of our lungs. By the time we got to the end part where we you know, sang the where do we go, where do we go now, my dad actually joined in. Now, a few months ago, I was driving my own son to the park with a bunch of his friends. Sweet child of mine came on the radio, you guessed it. Same thing happened. Every kid in that car was singing the song, top of their lungs. Only difference is I was singing right along from the get-go. It's just one of those perfect songs that remind us of childhood memories. Priceless. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Guns N' Roses and Sweet Child of Mine. What are your memories of this perfect song? Let us know in the comments. Let us know about that time, about Appetite for Destruction. Be sure to check out our other GNR installments. We have a couple other ones. Also, make sure to subscribe below so you never miss out on our daily videos. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. <laughs>